Dave. Um, welcome everyone to this research event from the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. I'm Tom Cornford and I am responsible for organising and chairing most of these events. Um, it's great to have lots of people with us online and it's great to have Roberta Mock with us. She's Professor of Performance and Executive Dean of the School of Performing and Visual Arts at Royal Holloway University of London. And she's here to talk to us about her AHRC funded project around theatre production and sustainable, the sustainable use of materials. Um, I'm told that uh, publications are in the offing, but nothing is out yet. So this is a sneak preview for us all of this really important work. One housekeeping thing, I think, roughly uh, before we get going, and that is that if you want to ask questions, please, at any point, put them into the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of the Zoom thing on your screen. Um, that will make it easier for me to find them at the end rather than using the chat and it's less distracting for Roberta. So she's going to speak to us for around about an hour and then we will have um, some questions which I will put to her from you so yeah use the Q&A box and we'll have a discussion at the end but for the time being thank you Roberta for coming it's a pleasure to have you with us and over to you. Right well thank you so much Tom and thank you to colleagues at Central School of Speech and Drama for inviting me to share this work. And thank you to all of you for taking the time to be here. And I very much hope you find this of interest. So I'm going to present some of the findings of a year long HRC scoping study called Sustainable Materials in the Creative Industries or SMICI for short. This was a project led by Peter Oakley at Royal College of Art and it explored the sourcing, use, disposal, reuse, recycling, and upcycling of materials. And what we were trying to find out was how the creative sector was responding and contributing to the development of a circular economy. And I was the co-investigator responsible for the performing arts. So my talk this evening is going to focus on practices and attitudes related to the sustainable use of materials in predominantly UK theatre. And here, theatre is a term that embraces opera, dance, circus, site-specific performance, outdoor performance, and so on. However, my SMICI remit also included both music and live events like festivals. And uh, those were elements that my research assistant, Siobhan Bauer, focused on. Inevitably, I am also going to be drawing on the findings of the wider research team who are named on this slide, especially those that relate to fashion, textiles and accessories, film and photography, and also electronic and electrical equipment. So while the SMICI report that Siobhan and I wrote for the HRC also included consideration of venues, operations and performance environments, I'm going to bracket that for now, otherwise we will be here all night. So my focus is going to be on production processes. That is the making of a show, an event or a performance, as well as the material and operational elements that support and enable its specific presentation and the creation of its inner world. And I should also say that I am largely presenting a snapshot of what was happening and in the public domain at the very end of 2021. So, you know, there's no doubt that there have been further developments and activities over the past four months that I could also discuss, but I'm too. So my presentation is quite long and it's in five parts. So first, I'm going to outline challenges and concerns that have been raised by the community of practice related to the sustainable use of materials in theatre production. I'm then going to summarize what I believe to be the key sustainability issues in the performing arts in eight points. We'll then move on to the theatre industry's actions and initiatives in response to these issues, followed by a characterization of what I think a sustainable materials practice and environment in the performing arts might look like. And in conclusion, I'm going to offer 10 recommendations for future research, research that I hope maybe you will do as well. So let's get started. So according to the theater's trust director, John Morgan, quote, we work in such a labor intensive quick delivery industry. And some of this means that we have quite bad practices around sustainability and production, 
end quote. Not only does theater tend to operate within under-resourced infrastructures that demand fast, paradoxically costly solutions, but there is an expectation that taking time to build a more sustainable workflow will not prove cost-effective in the short term. And this is especially true in a landscape of staff shortages and reduced hours due to the pandemic. As the Unicorn Theatre's Greening Production Practices 2020 document states, quote, time gives us choices. The more time we have to assess and realize designs, the more sustainable we can be, end quote. However, even with the best intentions, pressurized lead times and high event turnover may prevent sustainable practice in a volatile political environment. For instance, the time required for ordering mechanical parts from abroad has increased due to Brexit, and some designs are just being abandoned in mid-build. As someone from the RSC workshops explained to us, quote, we've designed it and then we can't get the materials, so we have to make it quickly however we can possibly make it, end quote. So theatre as an industry tends to be conservative in its professional practices, and this tendency can be further aggravated by a lack of communication between artistic and technical teams. And this leads to working at cross purposes, the need to scrap ideas that have already been built, and overlooking environmentally friendlier alternatives which have little impact on production values or effect. There are also fears that I've heard that sustainable sets will all look like, quote, junkyards, or else, another quote, Peter Brook's empty spaces. Aesthetic concepts and assumptions of audience expectations, and here I'm thinking about one that was expressed at the Theatre's Trust 2021 conference that shows should hit you between the eyes, another quote, are often disproportionately prioritized over environmental impact. Now, on top of all this, the performing arts are characterized by their use of precarious labor. So in 2021, 71% of the theater workforce was self-employed or freelance. Abdul and Bechtu launched a petition last December to halt the practice of forced multi-skilling, that is across costumes, hair, wigs, and makeup in commercial theaters. And they were arguing that a lack of appropriate training will lead to lower standards as well as health and safety risks. And this practice also potentially impacts on the knowledge of and ability to access and use materials sustainably. A 2020 survey conducted by EcoStage, which is a grassroots initiative for the performing arts sector that embeds ecological thinking at the center of its creative process, identified the following reasons why practitioners and companies are not choosing sustainable production outcomes and options. Oops, I'm just gonna go back. I think I've gone ahead. No, oh, no, I just skipped one, sorry. Okay, um, so these include not knowing how to start implementing changes, a lack of unified thinking across the sector and contradictory information available. They also identified the need for a clear value statement, public recognition of values, and also practical knowledge from case studies exchange. They received word from their correspondents that um, in developing sustainable practice, they felt alone, that they were dealing with time constraints, and that there was a lack of funding or budget. Well-managed storage of prop sets and objects with well-catalogued and recorded management systems, online browsing capabilities and easy booking systems is essential to make reuse and repurposing of materials achievable and flexible for designers and production teams. So it's important to say that shared storage and reuse facilities are available in some regions of the UK, for instance, in Scotland. And there are also some free online resources for the reuse and recycling of objects and materials in the theatre industry. So for instance, there's Set Exchange where unwanted uh, items can be posted and made available to the wider community. And there's also Props List, which is a set costume and prop hire database. In general though, these resources are few and far between. And such storage also generates its own power needs such as high heat and light that also need to be taken into account. And uh, I finally got to the right slide, of course. 
There are well-publicized generic sustainability issues related to the materials used in and for costumes, costume props, backdrops, scrims, and so on. So these include polythene packaging, the use of anti-mold chemicals, low recycling of fibers and fabrics overall, the chemicals used in fiber and textile fabric preparation, fabric rinses, uh, finishes, as well as dye stuffs, and unsustainable practices by not paying garment workers a living a wage in cheap manufacturing processes. In particular, there are overlaps with the fast fashion industry, especially for productions in contemporary dress. So many, many companies buy costume items online in different sizes, colors, and styles, and they're unaware that when they return them, those returns almost always go straight to landfill or else are burned. Just like for costumes and textiles, there are generic sustainability issues for electronics, such as lighting and control equipment. These include sourcing technology metals, uh, planned obsolescence, difficulties in repair and reuse of equipment, difficulties in recycling, the international dumping of e-waste, as well as the toxicity of e-waste as compound materials. Moreover, there is a murkiness about who the responsible custodians of materials are. For instance, at least one of the UK's largest hire houses appears not to be registered as a producer of electronic waste nor as a licensed waste carrier. So there are certainly a number of barriers related to the disposal end of a product's life cycle. And these include the so-called siloism with waste management solutions for some materials purposefully mystified in order to quote, corner the market. The tension between profit and open dialogue that is required for sector-wide collaboration prevents informed choices about both the sourcing and measurements of raw materials for a production. IP clauses can prevent transparency around the provenance of a material and its composite parts, as can complex supply chains. As a result, it can be very difficult to determine how much of a material has been previously recycled. Now, although there are attempts to calculate the carbon dioxide equivalent of production materials, this remains crude and tends to be specific to the organization. Carbon calculators are in constant development, but are still not reliable or fit for purpose in a theater making context. In 2008, the Office for the Mayor of London published Green Theater, Taking Action on Climate Change, with an associated online carbon calculator to, quote, identify the environmental impact of decisions made in the pre-production stage, end quote. While still regularly referenced, the carbon calculator itself is no longer available for use. However, its methodology is outlined in the document, which makes it seem that its focus on lighting, power, building management systems, audience travel, and so on, actually aligns more closely with venues and environment rather than the production focus, which is what I'm talking about this evening. The sustainability issue that arises more than any other in the forums that I've been attending though, is touring. Now by its very definition, touring is not sustainable. It is not of place. Therefore, many of the so-called so sustainability solutions offered are mostly exercises in reducing damage. In 2010, so over 10 years ago, Julie's Bicycle published the three volume report, Moving Arts, Managing the Carbon Impacts of Our Touring, which remains relevant today. Um, but it is actually worth noting that the report focusing on theater did not include greenhouse gas emissions related to stage set materials or merchandising, for instance. So there's a, there's a separating out of all the various elements of theater making when reporting on um, greenhouse gas emissions. The reports for both orchestras and theater state that reducing environmental impacts will require the development of entirely new touring models. For instance, more performances per tour at a single or multiple venues and assessment of logistics. So performance travel, performer travel, freighting of instruments, sets, et cetera. And this is going to require new tools, guidance and training, as well as investment to pilot and demonstrate models that reduce environmental impacts while still extending audience reach 
and maintaining economic viability and artistic quality. The design, construction, and choice of materials for sets, rigs, and staging for touring um, productions currently does not prioritize issues such as the weight or truck or air pallet or container packing or space requirements, all of which contribute significantly to the carbon emissions arising from transport and freighting. For instance, the promotional material for the 2017 Birmingham Royal Ballet production of Cinderella, which you can see here, proudly boasts that, quote, 10 articulated lorries packed with scenery, flats, props, lighting rigs, rails of costume, flight cases of wigs, and all the materials necessary to stage this beautiful ballet will pound the motorways of Britain, harnessing the equivalent power of 4,000 horses on a scale comparable to any major rock band's road trip, end quote. And on top of everything else, as Brigitte Wiens argued in her 2021 paper to the IFTR Scenography Working Group, performances and artworks are not always perceived to enact what they call for in terms of ecological knowledge and sustainability. Now the example she offered, so not me, but this was her example, was Ernesto Nesto's Gaia Mother Tree from 2018, which was a giant biomorphic structure of hand-knitted cotton that was installed in Zurich's railway station to create a locus for collective discussion, singing, and meditation on the environment. Made in Brazil with no nails or screws, the fabric and reconstruction in Europe involved a huge amount of travel and transport. Now, a Perform Europe report last year concludes that across the EU and the UK, quote, current funding and cultural policies do not stimulate and support the growing environmental awareness in the sector to be put in place, end quote. So Perform Europe is an 18 month project involving five partners that is testing sustainable and inclusive touring practices in the 40 countries of Creative Europe and the UK. And in all 41 countries, they found that structured incentives for ecologically considerate touring and presentation are insufficient. And many other support programs are, quote, at odds with greening ambitions. They require producing and presenting new work instead of recycling existing productions. They overfocus on quantitative indicators and do not stimulate using green transport means and so on. While the COVID-19 pandemic meant a widespread shift to digital production, largely in order to reach and provide access to audiences, several theaters and companies are now making digital productions with the reduction of environmental impact as a key driver. But there are often assumptions that such productions have little or no set costs for physical materials. And it has also been widely noted that many theaters have either withdrawn or vastly decreased their quote, post-pandemic digital offerings, thus undoing many sustainability and access gains and benefits. It is also widely assumed that digital production, streaming and downloading is inherently green and sustainable. But as Kyle Devine has noted, this relies on hidden, often exploitative regimes of labor to produce electronic components, as well as the concealed material realities of servers, routers, etc in order to meet the expectations of an infinite access and infinite storage. The cost of innovation, a three-year investigation into models and tools for technological and environmental innovation in the arts, reported last year that many practitioners want to use certain technologies, but they can't access them. And that such technologies are normally phenomenally expensive. They concluded with a warning that, quote, Chasing the new through technological innovation is bad for the environment, end quote. Let's move into part two. So I'm going to summarize the sustainability issues in the performing the arts as, uh, as we discovered them. So here we go. First, lack of knowledge, expertise, and or infrastructure for the sustainable sourcing, storage, recycling, repair, and disposal of staging and production materials. And these include technical equipment, rigging, costumes, objects, scenic elements, and their component parts. Two, lack of accessible, free, context-appropriate, reliable tools to measure, report, and compare the carbon emissions associated with all elements of live production and performances separately and together. 
And these have to include those produced directly, that is in the control of the organization, indirectly, not in control of the organization, and also embodied carbon, that is cumulative emissions throughout the supply chain. As Vimata Conte, the environmental sustainability manager for Manchester International Festival put it, you can't control what you can't measure. Number three, although for some reason it says number five, so I do apologize. <laughs> Fears and, oh, no, you know what? Um, I think I just skipped one. I put them in the wrong order. Okay, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna read number um, three and four because it's, I don't know where my slides are going. Number three, fears and assumptions that sustainable practices will limit aesthetic and creative freedom and vision. Number four, real or perceived financial costs and investment requirements, including those arising from increased time commitments, people and or training to enable sustainable practice. Moving into number five, sustainable practice relies on collaboration, clarity of responsibility, shared or agreed vision and values, and a sense of ownership by everyone involved in the chain of production. And this is particularly challenging in precarious industries with significant freelance workforces. Number six, environmental considerations are not systematically embedded into touring practices, as we just discussed, the transport of materials at any stage of the production process or audience travel to venues. Number seven, real or perceived audience expectations or cultural values, including those related to production standards, value for money, technical originality and levels of spectacle, as well as environmental impact within the context of climate crisis. And number eight, while generally and broadly welcomed, the proliferation of guidelines, commitments, codes of practice, standards and regulations available to support sustainable practice in the performing arts can seem overwhelming, onerous and guilt inducing. There are some fears that they might ultimately exclude or limit organizations and practitioners who are unable to meet them. And that leads us into the next part of the talk. So in 2014, professionals from across the performing arts um, production industry came together to form the Sustainability and Production Alliance or SIPA. So among them were representatives from Professional Lighting and Sound Association, Association of British Theatre Technicians, Stage Management Association, Julie's Bicycle, Theatres Trust, the ALD, now the ALPD, Equity, Arts Council, Society of London Theatres, UK Theatres, um, Society of British Theatre Designers, Women in Stage Entertainment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the following year, um, SIPA produced a list of 10 goals, and actually there were nine goals, since the 10th one was left blank to signal that, quote, it's impossible to imagine the way our field will look in 10 years time. So most relevant for this talk are goals four to seven. Zero loss, cradle to cradle materials, resources, and expertise. Two, responsible resourcing, choosing forever. Three, running on renewables, powering sustainably. And finally, people, planet, profit reporting, sustaining transparency. The intention was not only that individuals and companies would sign up as goal allies, but that there would be a network of goal guardians who act as advocates and collate and record information and successes and failures for inclusion in an annual report. Now, that didn't seem to happen um, or have taken root. However, the network and collaborative approach established seems to have paved the way for the Theatre Green Book, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. In 2020, SIPA published a list of 10 quick sustainable wins for 21 different production areas or roles on its website. And I'll, I'd encourage you to look at them if you haven't already. And I'm gonna go through a few of them now. So staging. So considering what will happen to the set after the show, working to circular economy principles, minimizing virgin materials. Video, considering how video elements can form part of a wider sustainable solution for a project, resulting in less physical materials use. 
ensuring there are upgrade paths and that technology investments are made with long-term life cycles. Packaging, using equipment of the lightest weight, things like that. Three, costumes. So under costumes, they have recycling, checking the credentials of suppliers and fabrics, and also crucially replacing fabric softeners, which is something we can all do at home as well. Uh, winches and automation, repairing rather than replacing damaged equipment, renting where possible, using sustainable synthetic rope. Theater production managers, so you can see this on the slide. This includes reconsidering the choice, sourcing and use of materials, especially non-biodegradable, encouraging designers to reuse set and asking suppliers to supply their sustainability policies. And the last one I'm going to mention is audio. So that includes investing in equipment that is recyclable and planning for disposal, using less gaffer tape, we can all do that, minimizing and recycling consumables and avoiding additional or oversized cable. The following year, in March 2021, volume one of the Theatre Green book was published in beta version. It's open access and it can be downloaded for free, and I encourage you to do so. Led by the Theatres Trust and the ABTT, the Association of British Theatre Technicians, and developed with and supported by all the leading UK theatre bodies and sustainability organisations, the Theatre Green Book was created with a broad coalition of UK theatre makers, including freelancers, venues, companies and producers. Its purpose was not to produce an alternative or reinvent the wheel, but to synthesize, amplify, and find commonality across existing practices and guidelines, including, for example, those produced by SIPA, EcoStage, Julie's Bicycle, and so on. The Theatre Green Book therefore presents a statement of shared and negotiated values. It draws together current best practice in sustainable production, and it sets out collective standard for achieving change in response to climate crisis. Within months, the National Theatre, National Theatre of Scotland, and National Theatre Wales, as, many as, as well as many other companies and organisations, committed to making all of their shows to Green Book standards. The Theatre Green Book's key materials principles include doing more with less, spending more on people's time and less on stuff, and reducing harmful chemicals. In its materials hierarchy, and you can see that it's kind of blurry, but it's on the slide, everything in a truly sustainable show will have had a previous life and everything will be used again in a circular economy. The goal is to start by designing out the need for materials. Whatever is needed should come from a reused or recycled source, locally if possible to reduce transport. Next best are materials which are at least sourced sustainably. And at the very bottom of the pyramid are raw materials which involve carbon and are destructive to manufacture and they ought to be avoided. There's a similar process for thinking about what to do with materials and objects after production close. And that ranges from the best, reusing it in the theater, down to the worst, which is becoming landfill. The Theater Green Book offers detailed models and guidelines for three standards, baseline, intermediate, and advanced. Baseline productions, for instance, will use only sustainably sourced materials and at least 50% previously used materials in their making processes. And they will also commit to 65% reuse or recycling when disposing of them. Only advanced productions are expected to use carbon calculators. And this is because it states, more data is needed to establish carbon budgets for shows and few theater makers so far are trained in their use. The Theater Green Book therefore recommends the use of materials inventories, enabling organizations to use the data to create their baseline, to track improvements and to identify problem areas or to prioritize so-called easy wins. In an inventory, all materials in a production are recorded by weight, if possible. While a large organization like the National Theatre has developed its own bespoke carbon calculator, it is also using um, a materials inventory method as well. Some of the other initiatives recommended by the Green Book to enable more sustainable production practices include modular design, virtual modeling, so increasing the use of CAD and so on to eliminate the waste associated with white card models, 
and the use of materials passports in order to record and monitor the carbon footprints and histories of specific objects in use. Ultimately, Volume 1 of the Theta Green Book emphasizes that sustainability requires new and different ways of working, and these depend on collegiality and collaboration. They demand more time, and they promote different kinds of creative relationships. It suggests that there are additional benefits to this form of sustainable practice. Quote, working collaboratively improves working culture for everyone. Working collectively brings more diverse talent into the industry. Working locally connects theater to communities, end quote. So that's from the Green Book. Now there's no body to enforce the theater Green Book guidelines and standards. Its creators and lead partners hope the industry would implement the code voluntarily. However, at the 2021 Theatres Trust Conference, Art Council England's Director for Theatre in London stated that working to the Theatre Green Book standards, while not mandated, quote, for complicated reasons, will be expected by national portfolio organisations or NPOs in order to meet its environmental responsibility investment principle. So for those of us following friends and mutuals on social medias completing their NPO applications in the run up to the deadline next week, it's easy to see how this might produce some very mixed feelings. In January, the Theatre Green Book won the stage's Innovation of the Year Award on the basis that not only are its recommendations, quote, changing internal and outward facing policy, but also that it sets the UK theatre industry apart in its progressive response to the climate emergency. That was a quote. In offering guidance, priorities and targets at a range of levels for all of the roles um, that contribute to the industry, the stage described the Theatre Green Book as truly holistic and said that it makes clear, quote, that reducing theatre's carbon footprint can no longer be thought of as someone else's problem, end quote. The Theatre Green Book was always designed as a living and evolving document. Its processes and recommendations still require real world travel, trialing and the availability of clear examples demonstrating its implementation in different contexts and different types of production work. My current research project, which is called Transitioning to Sustainable Production Across the UK Theatre Sector, um, was co-commissioned by the Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre and also Arts Council England. And what we're doing is we're producing three case studies of productions that are currently trialing the Theatre Green Book throughout 2022. So we're working with the RSC, Theatre Alibi and National Theatre of Scotland in order to add to the knowledge that is increasingly being shared by companies and organisations such as the National Theatre and also Belfast-based Tinderbox Theatre Company. But as our case studies are still in progress, in the next section of the talk, I'm just going to briefly summarize Tinderbox's evaluation of their trial of the Green Book Sustainable Production Guidelines last October and November. The full report is available on their website and it includes their materials inventories, summaries of their challenges, solutions, and findings. So Tinderbox decided to trial the Theatre Green Book for its production of, the, of Sylvan because, quote, in line with our values, we felt that our work should also explore environmental working practices as well as artistic themes, end quote. Publicity material described Sylvan as a nightmarish immersive experience bringing together live performance, horror and sound design in site specific woodland locations. For Sylvan, Tinderbox achieved their baseline standard target with 53% of materials having had a previous life and 97% of materials either recycled or intended for reuse afterwards. On top of this, the artistic director notes that creating performance while adhering to the Green Book was liberating because it offered, and here's quite a long quote that I'm gonna read out, the opportunity to place an incredibly important and necessary mission into the creative process. And it opened up a space for creatives and performers to discuss the effects of climate change and develop a strong sense of personal and shared values, responsibility and awareness on environmental themes as an ensemble. Artistically, the work actually became much more ambitious and richer in style and form, along with a sense of accomplishments for such a valued cause. The Theatre Green Book is a fuel for the artistic process, end quote. 
The company identified as one of their major challenges, a combination of Brexit and their geographic location, which quote, means that Northern Irish companies are quite limited in terms of suppliers of sustainable materials, end quote. When they are able to comfortably achieve baseline standard for, for productions, Tinderbox are going to aim for intermediate standard for their new shows. They also plan to develop a sustainability info sheet for teams and venues who are in sharing relationships with them, detailing local suppliers of sustainably sourced materials. Okay, so now I'm gonna zoom out again to discuss some of the actions taken and practices that have been developed by the theater community to support low carbon and low waste productions. There are many formal and informal networks within the UK performing arts community committed to sustainability. So EcoStage, for instance, maintains a website that includes a range of resources related to sustainable production, including case studies, guidelines, and a catalog of links to organizations, um, projects, and documents. It has also produced a pledge for individuals and organizations to sign up, which is in line with other networks and organizations such as Culture Declares Emergency. Other networks and organizations include Variable Matter, which is a collective of creatives, mainly academics, but not identifying as such in this context, who focus on the intersection of design, social impact, and environmental agency and legacy via commissions, consultancy, and experiential activations. And there's also Staging Change, a group of 250 or more performers, makers, and venues in theater and entertainment industry. And they have a website which publishes resources and updates members on events, workshops, and opportunities. Many organizations, unions, and associations also have their own sustainability groups. So for instance, the ALPD is currently working on a new green guide and code of practice for lighting to complement the theater green book. Stories are starting to emerge of compromise between technical teams, designers, and directors. So for example, cutting or minimizing balloon drops or recycling balloons afterwards into bricks. Venues and design teams are also reducing the use of or exploring alternatives to special effects such as smoke, haze, and dry ice, which all involve chemical manufacture, as well as snow, which becomes waste. Disassembly techniques, such as using visible and physical fixings, preferable over toxic adhesives, um, as once bound to a material, it cannot then be recycled, are starting to be implemented at the technical design stage so that items can be returned to constituent parts at their end of use phase. Theater production managers are also beginning to prioritize alternative forms of procurement, such as borrowing, hiring, and sourcing locally. Some organizations and companies such as the Unicorn Theater are buying from large scale providers online with rapid delivery as a last resort. Some producing theaters such as the RSC which with large storage facilities are finally beginning to sort and catalog their collection of props, costumes and materials for easy access and reuse. In early 2021, a survey was commissioned by Greater London Authority about the development of a reuse and recycling facility for London theatres. And they were asking whether productions were likely to use recycled materials in general, components such as doors, windows and stairs, flats, floors, costumes, props, stage equipments, lighting practicals, drapes and curtains, and if so, what their criteria were. So was it location, travel distance, assets, material on offer, condition, etc. So people are starting to really dig into the needs of the community and then trying to tailor solutions around them. The SBTD Sustainability Costume Group is planning to relaunch The Attic, which is a service for freelance theater designers, wardrobe supervisors, companies, and organizations. And their aim is to create a circular economy for unwanted costumes. They launched a survey uh, last December to gauge interest in and inform the, its establishment as a CIC business with permanent premises, workspace, and workshops. And many companies already recycle or donate excess or scrap fabric. So for instance, the RSC donates to Jericho Social Enterprise. And there is also really important work being done by practitioner researchers. 
So at a sonography working group session at the International Federation of Theatre Research annual conference this year, last year, 2021, Sophia Pantu-Vaki discussed the concept and example of eco-materiality in costume design. And she started with this list of R's to guide sustainability in costume, which are really great. And most of us here in this room will know about Tanya Beer's groundbreaking concept of eco-sonography, which integrates ecological thinking into all stages of scenographic production and aesthetics. So Beer's performance installation Strong in 2013, for instance, dissolves those boundaries between performer and designer, installation and costume, site and material, by exploring the journey of a material, in this case, reclaimed salami netting, rescued from landfill and its capacity to create immersive performance spaces, as well as wearable artifacts, which were auctioned after the show for charity. So instead of limiting resources in response to concerns about sustainability, Beer's concept of eco-sonography considers how ecological and artistic integrity can be a fundamental part of sonographers' ideas, processes, and aesthetics. It comprises three equally fundamental stages. So co-creation, that is pre-production, place-based, local, works with opportunities and resources that are readily available. Celebration, production stage, whereby performance is not an endpoint, but a platform to material materially showcase and to sustainability with audiences. And also circulation, that is post-production, taking afterlife of theater materials into consideration, rethinking the potential of um, refuse um, as a valuable resource and advocating for the sharing of cultural values, tools and networks, as well as artifacts. And I highly recommend reading Tanya Beer's work. She is also currently exploring new models of stage design for touring in which as a lead designer based in Australia, she produces a recipe for a set design that is then interpreted and built in London where all of the materials are sourced. And this is really similar um, to an alternative touring model described by Natasha Tripney in the stage as, quote, theater as blueprint or as franchise, end quote. And this includes, for instance, Katie Mitchell's and Jerome Bell's collaborative project for Teatro Vidi Lausanne Sustainable uh, Theater, which is still ongoing. Mitchell and uh, Bell, neither of whom will fly, have produced the text and material required for mounting uh, productions at various venues, each of which will adapt their own version of the show, working with a local director and local actors. So for Tripney, such currently radical practices simultaneously question traditional production processes and practices of global touring. Now, there are numerous conversations taking place about touring in the UK. So I've been told by practitioners that although the Creative Green Tools, which are a set of free online tools developed by Julie's Bicycle to calculate the carbon footprint of tours, they are crude, but um, it is said that they are probably sufficient for now in order to help track an organization's progress over time. National Theatre of Scotland recently told me that after agonizing for years over their status as a touring company, they began to consider their emissions from travel and transport more closely in relation to those which would otherwise be created via audience travel to centralized venues. So there's no one size fits all here. Creation Theatre's report, Digital Theatre, A Route to Sustainability, last year, estimated that its staging of a digital show resulted in a 98% reduction in its carbon emissions compared to an in-person production. Now, this was largely due to a reduction, again, of audience travel, combined with no need to design or build or transport sets or produce or dispose of single-use marketing materials made of coded paper or board. Similarly, one of the other proposed solutions to touring proposed by uh, Natasha Tripney in the stage last year, um, which combines concerns with sustainability, that is performer travel and materials use in transport and audience access, is the use of virtual reality. I'm not going to go into that, though, because that goes into a whole other place. But I will um, mention Fast Familiar's 2020 app-based interactive game or performance for remote audiences, which is called Smoking Gun, because it had a net result of zero carbon emissions. And they really outline exactly how they do, do this on their website. 
Their main learning points were the need to build apps from scratch using modules and to measure everything, which included the battery use of audience participant. Fast Familiar uh, worked with Abandoned Normal Devices and Arts Catalyst on a collaborative research-led project called The Network Condition, which explored the environmental impact of the creation and delivery of artworks using digital technology. And they have created and started to distribute a free-to-use carbon calculator to help artists and arts producers understand and reduce the impact of digital production. And Similarly, VJ Matthew has developed a carbon emissions calculator for streaming media in collaboration with Access Lab in order to provide a simple tool for cultural managers to budget their programs internet carbon emissions and also to provide a proof of concept design strategy that also embodies justice-based values. So, part five, what might a sustainable materials practice in the performing arts look like. So there is no shortage of vision for a sustainable materials practice in the theater, nor even route maps to achieve it. Detailed practical solutions are largely context specific, given the scale and breadth of the sector in terms of missions, locations, audience styles, and aesthetics. But clearly one milestone for the achievement of sustainable materials usage would be simply, <laughs> that all productions are able to demonstrate that they can meet the Theatre Green Book baseline standard. And indeed, the Green Book in and of itself is already being considered a beacon of good practice and a potential model for other sectors within and beyond the performing arts. Some mechanisms like formal and informal networks and associations that pool and share expertise, the development of open access resources produced by coalitions of practitioners, well, we've already heard they're already in place, we're already starting. There's a pretty widespread consensus that the infrastructure requirements for sustainable theater practice would be characterized in the following ways. So we've already heard a lot about widespread accessible storage, hiring and reuse, of, reuse facilities and resources for materials, objects, items, equipments, and their components. This seems to be a given. Um, we also need the embedding and of environmental sustainability in all operations, productions, tourism, and investment planning. We need the effective use of tools to collect, measure, and analyze environmental data over an extended period of time. So stopping changing the, the metrics and the mechanisms all the time so that we can't actually chart anything. We need the use of clean procurement and transport. We need effective partnership and collaboration with the construction industry to ensure economies of scale. We need knowledge, resource, and research sharing with other creative industries. And we need government investment and support programs that enable change and innovation, not just good words. And finally, we really need widespread accessible training to develop knowledge, skills, and expertise. What is also clear is that the performing arts do and cannot operate in a national or global legislative and infrastructural vacuum. So this includes the need for, for instance, electronic equipment standardization, further clarity and understanding of extended producer responsibility or EPR, the strengthening of vulnerable supply chains and the development of alternative materials as mitigation. We need systems and policies that allow for maximum recovery and reuse of raw materials, better understanding and controls of hazardous byproducts and chemical use in textiles. We need more informative labeling and transparent identification of the provenance of materials. And we need the valuing via healthy working conditions and fair wages of creative and cultural practitioners, as well as everybody involved in the chain of production. As SIPA asserts in its sustainability goals back in 2015, quote, people and planet will take their place in the profit loss accounts of our industry, end quote. And this requires audience engagement and outreach that directs attention to their role, creativity and influence. And here we are in my final part. So I'm gonna finish by identifying 10 areas for future, resource, for future research that arose for me from our scoping study last year into the sustainable use of materials in the performing arts. And hopefully I won't have missed any of them out um, 
so far. Now, before I do that, however, I'd like to flag that Perform Europe is currently consulting on their draft policy recommendation on sustainable inclusive touring practices. These, uh, these policy statements include funding and knowledge sharing mechanisms between countries practicing green models. It includes multidisciplinarity, geographical balance, the consideration of digitization within an overarching performing arts ecosystem and crucially relationship building. And their survey is open until the 23rd of May. So um, please take part. Now also last month, Arts Council England and Julie's Bicycle published their annual Culture, Climate, Environmental Responsibility Report for 2020, 2021. They're always one year behind. It ends with a list of priorities arising from discussions with cultural practitioners in the spring of 2020, focusing on climate action and regenerative economics. And these include a call for policies to support local placemaking with decarbonization incentives, the requirement for greenhouse gas emissions reductions for medium and large organizations are the requirement, not just it would be nice. Skills development supported with impact data, better dialogue and partnerships to support investment in infrastructure, transport and circular resource use. And finally, a focus on inclusion and justice. The report also notes that since these priorities were first discussed, the cultural landscape has obviously moved on significantly due to pandemic, the IPCC reports of the sixth assessment, COP26, and the government's leveling up agenda. But as they note, these are priorities that remain relevant and continue to demand action. And they also align closely with my recommendations for future research topics, investment and development. And I've linked those back to the sustainability issues or SIs identified earlier, the one with the missing slide. So here they are. The compound impacts of COVID-19 and Brexit on sustainable performing, making, uh, performance making practices and aspirations. I just realized that they're not in order, but that's okay. Uh, the infrastructures, training and education and professional development opportunities required to equip and prepare creative practitioners with the generic and disciplinary specific skills, knowledges and resources to make sustainable work and embed circular economy principles. The development of accessible, effective carbon calculating tools and resources for the performing arts, including digital production, that enable prioritize change and management, and that's the important thing. <laughs> um, I already mentioned on the previous slide the efficacy and impact of carbon offsetting on, um, I don't know if this is on this slide, on the efficacy and impact of carbon offsetting on sustainable practices and behavior, the efficacy and impact of carbon literacy training on sustainable creative practice for both individuals and organizations in the short and long term. And that's some research that we're doing now on our transitioning project. Low carbon, low waste performance touring models that do not disadvantage exchange or create further asymmetrical relations with the global south. The impact of regulation, monitored standards and accreditation or sector-wide codes of practice and guidelines on the decarbonization of the creative industries. And that's going to become very important if the Green Book is adopted more formally, for instance, um, by Arts Council England. The application and adaptation of indigenous performance and design methods, knowledges and practices the impact of working across and between creative disciplines, industries, and organizational structures on the sustainable knowledge and practice of individual artists, practitioners, and designers. And finally, research is required on the impact and efficacy of triangulating sustainable production practice, thematic content, and messaging of productions that focus on environmental sustainability and climate crisis as well as broader approaches and framings of climate justice. Thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions and comments or just anything. Thank you very much. Thanks Roberta, that was great. Um, really, really interesting and um, loads to dig into. I have a whole page of questions scribbled in front of me. So everybody else, um, can I ask you to use the Q&A box to put any questions that you have? 
to Roberta. And um, in the meantime, I will, uh, I'll take chair's privilege and try a couple maybe. So I guess, I mean, you have talked about this obviously, um, but I wondered if you could sort of maybe summarize a little bit, um, two things about what you're saying. So, so the first thing is what kinds of systemic changes do you think um, this, this kind of approach requires uh, to, the, to the industry sort of, uh, or, or you might imagine it as a sector. Um, so what kind of things do you think we would actually need to change in order really to be able to implement the kinds of recommendations you're proposing? And then um, the second thing, I wondered about what kinds of changes it might lead to, because obviously like that, you know, these, these kinds of practices will have aesthetic consequences, they'll have you know, loads and loads potentially of other consequences and potentially we might see this as a kind of um, conjunctural opportunity to to remake the theatre in a, in a very different way in lots of, lots of uh, along lots of dimensions. So um, a two-part question for you. That's really interesting, thank you. And weirdly, even though I've, you know, said everything that I had to say, um, if I was going to draw out the, the sort of main infrastructural thing off the top of my head that I think is really important is I think we have to rethink financial and investment models for theater. Um, this, is, this is sort of inherent in the green book as well. They say we have to spend more time, more money on people and time and less money on stuff. Right. So we have to rethink where the money goes and we have to invest in people's skills. We have to invest in people's training. If we have a 71 percent or more freelance or gig economy, how are those people training up? So it's all well and good saying that we have a model and a system that people can follow. But who is paying them to train? Right. <laughs> so we need a proper living wage for people who are working in the theater sector. We need more stability. We have to rethink um, a precarious economy. We have to stop making um, productions really, really super quick. <laughs> we have to actually spend time thinking things through. And part of thinking things through and spending time also means um, developing those proper storage facilities, reuse databases, et cetera that will eventually save time. So that if someone knows they need this, they'll be able to reach out across the sector and, and, and find it easily. We need much better sort of cataloging and stuff. So at the moment, those sort of things have not been prioritized because it is frankly cheaper and easier to throw something in a skip after a production than to catalog it, break it down, store it, make it available, put it on a database and so on. So I would say that we really actually have to rethink everything to do with our financial infrastructure and modeling of performance. So what will that lead to? Well, it will lead to a, um, a healthier workforce. <laughs> it will lead to more space and time for creative solutions. It will lead to a, uh, a, theater, a theater ecology that can be more creative. It will lead to more local solutions. It will lead to collaborations um, locally with communities and with other uh, people outside of the creative industries as well. Um, it should lead to placemaking. It should lead to, and ultimately, it will lead to a reduction in, in carbon emissions as there is more reuse, recycling, less disposal in harmful ways, et cetera. Um, and that includes sort of the use of toxic chemicals, like just absolutely everything. Um, the other thing, um, which is related, I suppose, is that we need to see, even though I just sort of said very much about the local, we have to see theater making within a global context. And those costumes you buy, um, those fast fashion costumes that you buy um, using apps and those have, and you send back three quarters of them because they're not quite the right size and whatever, those have, impact on a global scale in, um, in, in countries 
where the labor force isn't being paid enough. Like it has, your choices as a theater maker actually does sustain um, an unequal, an unequal relationship with countries in the global south and also puts pressure on uh, the most vulnerable countries to climate crisis. And it, because, you know, every, because these are actions that we take. Um, and so you have to see this, that this isn't just a local thing. You are part of uh, an international and global infrastructure and your, your actions, our actions as theater makers have consequences. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, I guess one thing, I mean, there's a few, there's a few dimensions to that, right? There's a few uh, aspects to that. One of the things which strikes me as there's an intersection here with COVID is the degree to which theater uh, is a kind of rentierist sector, right? So that, so that it is run by people who are able to um, leverage their ownership of property and resources and so on in order to make to make profits, right? And so they kind of get everyone get back to work because Pret aren't able to pay their rent to their um, to their landlords or whatever. Um, really strikes at this, doesn't it? That the extent to which theatre is based on the capacity to own West End theatres, um, rent them to people, um, doesn't that constitute a major barrier to to the or that and other issues that you mentioned outsourcing other kinds of um, are there, are, is there work going on um, to think about how we can sort of divest from those kind of economic models that you're aware of? Or um, have you got thoughts about that? There are actually another, a, a number of campaigning organizations. I don't know how effective they are yet. <laughs> I know it's not like the, these campaigns aren't out there. Any of us who are active on social media know, um, you know, that, that the stories are out there. Um, the networks are out there. I don't think that they're. I don't think they're making any in, inroad, inroads yet, though. I have to actually say. So I think that there's an acknowledgement of it, but I'm not sure we know what. Uh, I don't. I don't think anything's happened concretely yet. I'm not sure if that. You know, that's a very. It's a sort of utopian question, <laughs> isn't it? But yes, of course, we do have to change those models. And the only way I can see to do it is to show that there is benefit and there's ironically financial benefit <laughs> in it, you know, uh, fighting neoliberalism with neoliberalism, I suppose. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I mean, I know from my own research, I think it's five years ago now, but with, with um, parents and carers in performing arts that we really hit a roadblock at the point where we were like, it's very difficult for people with caring responsibilities to do a tech rehearsal for 12 hours a day, by the way, folks. And they were like, yeah, but if we delay it, then we have a dark week and we just can't afford a dark week. And then, that, you know, that's a brick wall and there was no, there was no getting, there was no getting around it. We have some questions in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to go to Steve Scott Bottoms first. Thanks, Steve. Is anybody in the sector talking about resilience adaptation? He's asking as distinct from sustainability. So he mentions there seems to be a lot of emphasis on kind of doing the right thing environmentally, which is great, but the environment is also going to do things to us. Yeah, indeed, in a big way. So what extent, uh, to what extent is, is this being factored in? For instance, what happens if, if and when theatres become too hot? Um, you know, obviously we can, we can air condition them, but that's going to make it worse. So, so um, yeah, a question about adaptation and resilience. Um. So the adaptation tends to come up more um, in particular related to the venues operation side of things. Um, it has to, to do with the refurbs of old theaters and stuff like that. So mainly when I've come across adaptation is literally talking about the adaptation of buildings um, and the use of buildings and the repurposing of different types of buildings and different parts of buildings and so on. So I have to actually say that that is the, the only time I've really heard much about adaptation in that particular sense. Um, but now I'm going to look, look for it, Steve. Thank you very, very much. And thank you for being here too. Um, thank you. That's such a great comment. On. Mute Paul Colwell. Hi, Paul is is asking about um, following the money to get to the heart of the issue, um, which is of course coming 
mainly from audiences, or at least in, in, a, in a good part from audiences. So do you think they will, they are already or will start impacting sustainable practices in theatre? For example, can you imagine a world where audiences would proactively choose to spend their money on tickets for productions which are demonstrably more sustainable than those which are less so? Is there, you know, is, is there a way of working the, the demand side? I guess. Yeah, there is. And that, that was quite a big topic of conversation um, in certain sessions at the Theatres Trust 2021 conference as well. So changing audience behaviour um, is, is a really important part of the, implement, the operations implementation of the Green Book. So, um, and that sort of is manifesting in a number of ways, um, including, for instance, theaters and festivals that are working directly with local bus companies to make sure that there are actually buses that leave when a, a show ends as opposed to, to, to mean that people don't actually have to drive to the, the theater. Um, so that's happening, that people can, um, can also find out more um, about, about the sustainability credentials when they, when they buy their tickets. Um, there is, I think we've all noticed more pay as you can elements um, and that often there are donational aspects so that if people pay as they can, then they can donate for other aspects of things. There's also some stuff that I, I have to say is kind of performative. Um, I hate using the word in that particular way, but it is being used um, because, because some venues think that audiences really care about this. So um, for instance, the number of uh, beehives on the top of theater buildings, <laughs> for instance, um, those are largely there because I think um, theaters think that audiences want to think that they are there. Um, so yes, there definitely is talk about changing audience behavior. And there is definitely talk of the fact that um, if there's any if there's any group that can leverage change in the industry, it's going to be the ticket buyers, the bums on seats. They're they're going to um, if they start if if they start seeing shows with very specific credentials and not seeing shows with, without them, then that is actually going to send a, uh, a message, and I think it would be heard as well. Great, thank you, Roberta. There's a, there's a question. I'm going to jump down to Alexis, um, who's got a question. Um, because they're studying productions with a focus on sustainable practice. Um, uh, so they're an event producer, often working in the charity and health sector rather than the theatre sector, and found some pushback, I, I think that's probably talking mildly, to sustainable practice because of the lack of time and funding. Do you know of resources that are specific to producing events that are not theatre-centric? Um, so I guess less about the materials that you use in the theatre production and more about event producing are you aware of that yeah um yeah i <laughs> part of part of the report that siobhan and i wrote to the ahrc actually did cover live events um and there is for instance an organization called green events um they have they have resources um not quite like the green book the green book is slightly ahead on that um, however, there are similar types of resources available for the events industry, and I'm ha absolutely happy to follow up with that. I have to actually check my notes, um, but, but they do exist. Um, I would actually say that some of that is also covered in the Theatre Green Book under operations and venues as well. Um, so things to do with marketing and so on. So you might actually find some stuff in the Green Book that is really useful for you. But the other industries, the music industry and also the live events industry have been have been working on this on this too in different ways. Um, and they are less focused on materials and um, more focused on, on other elements of, of sustainability. Great, thank you. Um, Matilda has a question about online, so streaming. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of this partly because I just asked for a flight to be booked for me to go to Iceland, as I'm sure a number of us have recently. Um, uh, and obviously you can't get there on a train. Um, uh, and a bit of me was like, I really would appreciate being able to do this from home, to be honest. Um, so uh, yeah, what, what, do, what do you think about um, uh, digital online forms of, of streamed theater. Um, clearly there is a capacity for them to reduce carbon emissions, although having seen NT Live bans 
outside theatres. I mean, they're not they're not doing a massive amount in that model, but clearly creation and so on are. So, um, what do you think the future of that is? Do you think we're going into a hybrid model? Do you, what do you think? About I think that I mean this goes back to the for me it goes back to the audience question, and um, if if audiences sort of insist and are willing to pay for especially live streams and hybrid events, I think that they're going to continue. I was kind of dismayed at how fast so many of the theaters and companies just abandoned their digital offering, um, especially since we're still in a pandemic. There's still lots of folks who do not go to the theater and who aren't willing to go to the theater um, for good, very good health reasons right now. Um, and it's really important that we are able to actually offer that sort of access. The other thing is that you know through the the through the pandemic, I was actually able to see work I was never able to see before as well. So it opens up an entire world of cultural um, cultural activity for for us too. So my feeling is that there has been a rollback that a lot of companies and organizations have abandoned the digital, um, but I think that that is financial, and I think that as soon as they find a model by which they can kind of sustain their entire operations, um, then they are going to do it. And they will do it if they feel that they can kind of, they're not going to lose money from the digital offering um, and that they are going to make money <laughs> um, from, from the digital offering in collaboration with the, with the live as well. Um, I, I'm not a fortune teller. I certainly hope that we, we continue to see um, live stream in particular, as opposed to just sort of recordings on, online. I think that that's really, really important. Um, but again, I think it's going to come down to financial models and it's going to, it's going to come down to audience push. Yeah, 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 I totally agree. Thank you. Um, uh, there's a question here from Andy Smith about um, what theatre performance and other creative arts departments can can do, what role they can play in embedding sustainability in the design of courses and curriculums. I also wondered, actually, I might just sort of jump onto the piggyback on that and ask a, a related question, which is about critical sort of frames of thinking. I, was, I reviewed a while ago a collection of essays about Eva van Hoover. And one of the most interesting things I thought about it was that somebody said in there, oh, you know, they design all of their shows, they make them to fit in two Pantechnicans because that's how they get out there, you know, and, and, and tour Europe regularly. Um, and of course, like it seemed to me as I read that, that there wasn't enough research also going on thinking about actually what are the practices of theatre making? How are they constrained by sustainability economic models. Why is Ivo van Hover so famous? Is it is it just because he's good at directing or is it maybe because he's good at fitting things into pantechnicans? So I wonder about that question, partly in terms of what we can do in terms of curriculums, but also what we can do in terms of our, our kind of uh, critical practices in relation to these issues. Well, I have lots of thoughts and they're mainly unformed. Um, let me start and see where I get to. The first thing is that when I first started this project, I was shocked at how little research there was. There was almost none, to be honest, into actual sustainable practice. There were lots of people talking about sustainability and, environmentally, uh, and environmentalism, but most people were concentrating on the messaging, the motifs, etc. And it took me a very, very long time before I finally found anybody who was, you know, talking about production practice. Okay, so first of all, I think as academics, um, there's too much separation in our disciplines between uh, the production elements and the critical thinking about sort of thematics, um, sort of social positioning, cultural positioning, et cetera. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. There was absolute. There was just like this huge chasm, and that's why I value someone like uh, Tonya Beer's work just so much, <laughs> because she really just broke all of that open and has been doing so for some time. Again, I have to actually say that I'm talking English speaking because that's what I have access to. But I, I'm I'm going. I don't know if there's other stuff out there. So for a start, I think that we have to stop. Um, I think that. 
theater and performance researchers have to actually start considering the means of production <laughs> um, on top of the thematics, the content and the means of distribution. So I think that that is really super important. Um, and the second thing um, that I'm thinking is we have to absolutely embed this in our teaching. So when we are teaching um, our designers of tomorrow, our builders of tomorrow, but equally, maybe not so vocational courses. So all of our theater programs that send our ensemble companies out into the world, we have to train them into the sort of basic stuff that I'm, I was talking about today, right? We, you know, they, they have to actually, they have to be introduced to the green book, for instance, so that at least they know where the resources are. They have to be introduced to resources like EcoStage and so on. Um, so what I can say also is that there is a, there are a lot of working groups around the Green Book, and one of them is the a higher education working group. Um, and you can become part of that network, and I'm, I'm really happy if you contact me, um, I should put my, maybe Tom will put my address in, in an email or something like that, because I'm not that easy to get a hold of these days, except by social media. Um, so, so there are there is actually a green book working group for higher education as well. Um, and the final thing that I'm actually thinking about is before we even start to talk about um, ensuring that we train people so that they're, they're creating theater sustainably from the beginning, as opposed to loading it on at the end, that you know, it's absolutely fundamental to the processes, even if we didn't learn them that way, our students have to learn them uh, that way. One way is I think we should embed carbon literacy training into all um, all university courses in the first year. <laughs> um, and there is some work across the sector. There's some really good um, carbon literacy training, including in my institution, Royal Holloway. And um, I really, truly think that that is our starting point, because once once anybody has sort of been confronted by the realities that's going to color the way they see everything and all of their activities. So that's a beginning to my thought. I didn't really answer your question, uh, Tom, except to think, except to say, it would be good if as researchers, we started thinking about this. <laughs> well, I mean, you said we should think about the means of production and that, you know, yes. <laughs> that doesn't say the same thing. <laughs> Only I'm this a, afternoon. So I meant can... literal means of production, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not as opposed to the sort of you know Marxist means of production. Although of course they're the same thing. Um, I I think maybe I'll maybe I'll combine Paul Colwell's put a couple of other questions in the chat, which I might um, in the sorry in the Q and A, which I might combine actually as a final um, uh, question looking to the future. So so one of them is sort of how do we prevent sustainability effectively from becoming a reason to cut theatre. So if you can't make it sustainable, let's just let's just get rid of it or um or we'll carry on doing it unsustainably because let's face it, compared to global food production or um, you know energy use, it's, it's such a low priority. So so what's your response to that and how do we ensure that it doesn't just become sidelined, I guess is the is the question there. Um, and then uh, what would be your key message to young theatre practitioners in training who um, who may be feeling that they don't have the agency to make the kinds of these kinds of huge changes um, uh, to the industry that they're that they're training to to enter? If you can combine those, then that will be a good way to send us off to our tea. I think. I think that the it's easier for me to answer the second thing. There is always something you can do always something you can do, right? So here's an example of a very simple thing that you could do. Um, instead of ordering costumes off, you know, the app with, that starts with an A and ends with an S, for instance, instead of ordering your costumes off that app and, and hoping that they fit, you go as a company into shops or you go, you take, a, spend a day going into uh, charity shops and you try on clothes together, for instance. So I've been hearing this from like the biggest of companies. They're starting to schedule in days that they, that, um, that actors go to shops with costume designers. Okay. And, and that, so that's, a, 
it seems really small, but that is something that you can do. There is always something that you can do. There's, there are always easy wins. So you don't, sometimes you just can't look at the big picture because it's so frightening, right? But there is always some little thing that we can do to make a difference. We can stop using coded paper on our flyers. We could stop using flyers, for instance. <laughs> like anything like that is making some sort of dis difference and it's cumulative and you set an example. So every time you do it, even as a young theater maker, you're going to set an example to older theater makers who might just feel slightly shamed that they are still doing things in a certain way. So I think that's that's really, really important. Um, and I guess my answer to the first part of the question isn't that dissimilar, right? That this isn't something... The, the, the thing that really attracted me to the to the theater green book was that this is incremental. Um, this is about saying this is what we can start to do. This is what we can try to do. This is what we can start from from doing nothing and everything you do will make <laughs> will make a difference. And as soon as it starts to encroach on um, the aesthetics or the profit line or whatever, it's OK stop do what you can and the next time you'll build it in so that you do it slightly differently right so it's not something that we're going to do overnight and i guess that's my my biggest thing we're not going to do it overnight but if we share awareness and we share our awareness with others it does become infectious and those little tiny actions will add up i mean they will add up. Are, are they fast enough? Are, are, is it enough? Probably not. Um, the only thing that I can say about this, I don't even know why this is coming into my head, but like, for instance, I smoked a lot, right? I smoked for like 30 years, quite a lot. <laughs> and um, nowadays, like, I can't, I can't imagine smoking. Like, it's such a shift in cultural values and so on. And and I think that sustainability is the same thing. After a while, you kind of forget that you ever did those things, right? You just have to keep sort of progressively working at it. Soon, most of us are going to be eating plant-based diets. Nobody would have seen that 15 years ago <laughs> or so on. So don't underestimate those, those small movements um, or the influence that they might have over time. Great. Thank you very much, Roberta. It was a real pleasure to talk to you and hear about the research, which is fascinating and really important and massively important for our students and everyone who teaches them. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Roberta, for presenting to us. I'm sorry we can't go out um, for a plant-based dinner, but we will, I'm sure, at some point. Um, yeah. And uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming and see you all again soon. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>